I'm Sam Jones, and we have today a guest we've been after, well, since he was first elected, our mayor, 40th mayor, G.D. Bynum. It's good to have you, my hey, friend. Hey, thank you for having me on. Really good to see you. I mean, you're just a flash around this place. <laughs> We're at your office, by the way. Yeah, well, we have a lot going on, and, you know, when I was first elected, the, the thought that went through my mind when I first found out that I'd won the election was, I've got four years to do as much as I can for this city that I love so much, and... I have a clock on my desk in my office that we have a countdown every day. It's like every day we got to be moving things forward. So I, I realized I got the whole rest of my life to rest. But for right now, I got to do as much as I can. Health because most <laughs> men would have said, "Oh Lord, what have I done?" <laughs> no, no. I was. I, this is a job I've, you know, aspired to and admired since I was a little kid. Well, let's go uh, back about that yeah. for just a minute. Yeah. At what point? Are we talking here? Third, fourth, fifth grade? Well, I mean, as far back, to... my grandfather was the mayor of Tulsa when I was born, and he retired when I was about six months old. I was very close with him and my grandmother growing up. And, and we're talking about Mayor LaFortune. Bob LaFortune, yeah. yeah. And everywhere that we would go, if we're going to the movies, we're going to a restaurant, we're going to a show at the Performing Arts Center, people would come up to him and want to talk with the former mayor, and then they'd always you know, kind of pat his little grandkid on the head and then tell me <laughs> why he'd been such a good mayor in their eyes. And so as far back as I can remember, I've been hearing people tell me why they thought a mayor was important and what the qualities of a good mayor were. So even before I had a clue what the mayor did, I thought, well, that's a job that apparently means a lot to people and I'd like to do that someday. So by the time you married, your wife had to know that that's oh. where you were headed. <laughs> yeah, my wife's from Norman uh, and we met when we were working on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., but we always knew that we'd be moving back to Tulsa. So she's okay uh, with this? Oh, yeah. No, she loves Tulsa. What about the youngsters? They love it, too. I mean, we were lucky because when I, well, one, my son was a year and a half old when I was elected to the city council. And so for both of them, being involved in public life is all they've ever known. Uh, but running for mayor, they were still young enough. They would have been 12 and 7 when I ran uh, no, that math's not right. Yeah, yeah, 12 and 7 when I ran for mayor, uh, or no, 9 and 7 when I ran for mayor. And for them, it was, it was all big, one big adventure. It, they weren't teenagers yet where it was totally embarrassing or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, well, for them, it was fun. Let me explain something very quickly. The reason he seems a little bit whoops today is because he's been involved in interviews for the police chief which yep. is not an easy task. How's no. that going, by the way? It's going really well. Um, you know, we, we recognize at the outset that we're changing the way our police department interacts with citizens and that we are really trying to find ways to build ties where citizens recognize that the way to make Tulsa safer is for citizens and police officers to work together to make the community safer. I think for a long time there was this kind of wisdom that, well, that's all on the police to make Tulsa a safer place. But we recognize and we've seen in Tulsa specific instances when you can empower citizens and officers to work together better, you make the community safer. And so keeping that in mind, I wanted this process to be very open and engage with citizens. So before I conducted a single interview, I held three town hall meetings around the city. So I wanted anybody who had ideas they'd want to share with me about what I'd be looking for to be able to mm -hmm. tell me what those were. All three of those town hall meetings were very well attended. Uh, you know, people were very candid in their thoughts about what they think about the department, what its, its strengths are, what its weaknesses are. Uh, and then I did individual meetings and small group meetings like with ministers in North Tulsa and business people in our Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really helped me going into the interview process. And I literally right before this interview started, finished my final uh, of our first round of interviews with our seven internal applicants. And that was a really impressive process to go through, to spend significant time with each of them. And it gives you a real appreciation for the caliber of people we have in that department. Uh, it's not gonna be an easy process to, no. to determine who ought to be the next chief, but uh, we want this process to be one that people feel like they have a, a part in. Well, you know, Tulsa's police department has always been, in my estimation, a cut above the rest, at least since I came here, Yes. you know, in the late 70s. Yep. Uh, I recall Drew Diamond had the push going for oh. uh, community policing. Yes. 
and they more or less, you know, laughed him out of out of town. Chief now, Diamond was way ahead of his time. He, I mean, he was. Yeah. And here we are, essentially, community <laughs> policing. Here, Twenty years know, later. Yeah, yeah, doing it. Yes, that's exactly right. No, uh, that, that's a great example of somebody being on the right track, but being mm -hmm. way ahead of their time on the idea. And so here we are now, uh, and every candidate that I'm interviewing, I'm wanting to know, are they really bought into community policing and what have they done to engage with people? What are their strategies to make that uh, a reality here in Tulsa? Uh, and, and that was very valuable uh, to hear from each of the candidates on, on that front. But I, I agree with you. I, I think we have the best department in the country, but you don't get that way by being self-satisfied. You have to be open and honest on what you're doing well and what other departments are doing better that you can mm -hmm. steal from them and bring here so that we know that we're always pursuing the best practices. And that's another one of the qualities I'm looking for in a chief is one who's not defensive about the way things are but is open to continuous improvement. One of the elements that seems to be overshadowing the rest mm -hmm. is trust. Yes. And it's hard to imagine not trusting a cop, mm. but there seems to be a pattern of that across the country. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that here with some elements or all elements of the community? Oh, absolutely. We do a thing here that we implemented when I became mayor. We, we partnered up with Gallup, which is probably the premier opinion research organization in the world, and we created the Gallup. Tulsa City Voice Index. It's the most in-depth opinion analysis that any city does. And it's the kind of thing that a large company would do with their clients and customers. And one of the key things that we focus on in that was trust of police. And what you find is the vast majority of Tulsa it's overwhelming trust in the police department. But there are key areas and specifically in North Tulsa, just north of downtown, uh, which is our predominantly African-American part of our city. And then some areas in East Tulsa, which is where a lot of our immigrant community uh, is based, uh, there are, it's almost the inverse of what you see in the rest of the city. And on the one hand, that, it's, it's heartbreaking when you see those numbers and you see what a challenge we have to turn trust around in those areas. On the other hand, it's great to know where the, the issue is and, and it allows us to be more targeted and focused in building that trust. I really think though, and, and what you see here in Tulsa is no different than what you see in major cities all around the country. Cities allowed their manpower to get so low that police officers who were spending most of their shift in a car responding to calls. Uh, in Tulsa, over 90% of our officers' average time was spent uh, responding to 911 calls. When, if you're doing community policing, the, the statistics show you, you should have 35 to 40% of a shift out on your feet, out of your car, getting to know people on the beat that you cover. And the trade-off of that, you know, cities, they, they weren't having to hire as many police officers to facilitate that, and so it saved them money, but the cost was the, the decrease in trust. Uh, when people, their only interaction with an officer is if they're a suspect or a victim, you can't help but have an erosion in trust. And so that's why we're staffing up our department at a record-setting pace right now. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to move on to other things, but sure. I've got one more police question to ask. Yeah. Are our police officers exempt from jury duty? And if they aren't, why not? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I believe they are, but I'm not positive. I don't because know. Because it strikes me, I was thinking about this the other day, if they're called into jury duty, somebody has to take their place, yeah. which means additional resources have to be funneled out by the city right? You know, to deal with it. The other thing I wanted to bring up, are we going to do anything about this, this live show or mm. the PD show? Uh, well, you know, we've we've gone back and forth on that. We had it for a while, uh, but it was specifically focused on one specialty unit that was in one part of town. Uh, and I had concerns about just officer safety, uh, and so we didn't renew our contract. But then I had a, a, a really powerful uh, episode in the last year where I was on a ride-along uh, 
by coincidence with that unit uh, and saw an interaction between officers and some people in one of our uh, apartment complexes that Tulsa Housing Authority operates. And there were some friends of mine who are uh, social justice activists in the community uh, who also were there and saw the same episode. I came away from that feeling like our officers handled it professionally. Uh, they were courteous to the people. They were doing their job and they were there to help uh, mm -hmm. protect those mm -hmm. folks. My friends who saw it felt like the officers were harassing people. Now, we both saw the exact same thing and, and that opened my eyes to the fact that two people can see the exact same interaction, exactly. but based on your background and your perspective, you come away with a different impression of it. And that's when, to me, I, I realized the value of having a show like Live PD is that it just puts the officers on patrol out there for people to see what they're doing and judge for themselves uh, what they think of the job that so they're doing. So you don't doing. have a problem with it continuing? No, I, I invited okay. it uh, and signed the contract for it to come back. There are a couple of books that include studies I might recommend. Great. One involves the gorilla in the room. Mm. And it, it, this one study is frightening mm. because it has a group of fellows with a basketball and mm -hmm. they're shooting the basketball back and forth to one another. And the narrator or the, the, the moderator of this focus study said, keep your eye on the ball. Mm -hmm. Never let your eyes leave the ball. <clears throat> Try to count the number of times it's passed. Mm. In the middle of this four minute passing of the ball, a man in a gorilla suit walks in frame <laughs> and walks out. Right. At the end, they shut it down and they say, okay, how many times was the ball passed? Everybody had different numbers. Mm -hmm. Uh, what side of the screen did the gorilla enter from? Hmm. Heads were cocked, nobody saw it. Interesting, interesting. There have been several studies like that. Yeah. That people sometimes see what they want to see. Correct, correct. As opposed to what they need to see. Exactly. You know? Yeah, no, and I, I think, I don't think it, it hurts to have that kind of transparency where people can see for themselves. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's always better if people go on a ride along. One of the benefits of having Live PD in Tulsa is that uh, we now have record numbers of people wanting to sign up for ride alongs uh, because they've seen the show mm -hmm. and they've realized I'd like to go out with our officers and see it firsthand. So uh, I think it's a, a useful tool for us in raising awareness of what officers deal with in the field every day. The governor recently was quoted as saying he gives himself an A for his performance to date. Yeah. Where do you rank yourself? Um, uh, not an A. Uh, I would say a B minus. Uh, I think we've assembled a really good team uh, and we've raised expectations in Tulsa. You know, there were two big reasons I ran for mayor. I thought we were aiming too low as a, as a community and especially as a city government. Uh, I think we've changed that. I think people now expect us to be globally competitive, uh, where people were laughing at me three years ago when I said that we should do that. Um, so I think we've made great improvements there. We've greatly improved the operations of the city. We've brought some great people into city government and we've inspired a whole new generation of people to get involved in local government. And we've set a different example as to how government can work uh, by bringing people from all over the political spectrum together and using data to solve practical problems instead of relying on partisan philosophizing and disagreement. So I think in those areas we've done a great job. Uh, but I think there's still so much more that we can be doing. The other reason I ran for mayor was that a kid that's growing up in North Tulsa is expected to live 11 years less than a kid anywhere else in the city. Uh, and I reacted to that when I saw that as a dad, first and foremost, and I thought the city needs to be raising awareness on this and needs to be doing everything it can for those kids to, to equal that out. I mean, they have a decade of their life being robbed from them just because of where they're growing up. I, we've put people in place and we've started processes to make an impact there, but we haven't made as much progress there as I would like us to, uh, both from the life expectancy disparity standpoint and building up trust between citizens and officers. That, that we still have a long way to go and I'm not satisfied with our progress there as at all. As a father, you're gonna be a bit skewed 
mm -hmm. when you look at certain facts and figures. Sure. And specifically, I want to address the number of hungry children yeah. we have in Tulsa. Now, I've seen some of the figures, and they're, mm -hmm. they're scary. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the number of children who get their only square meal of the day from schools, yes. then you step over here and you see what's happening to the schools and how they, we're, we're not really seeing the support for mm -hmm. public education that we should. Right. How do we balance this out? How do we bring the children that have a need? I know there are going to be folks out there who are going to say, well, it's not the job of the school to feed the kids. Somebody's got to. Yep. It, it, when you've got to support the schools in their growth pattern, you can't just keep enlarging the classrooms. You've got mm -hmm. to get good teachers. You've got to hold the good ones you've got. And you can't just keep slamming doors and saying, we solved the, the financial burden. We mm -hmm. haven't. Right. What I, do you see as, as the solution? I there? really believe the big answer there is empowering local communities to fund their school systems at the level they want to fund them. Right now, you know, we can pass local initiatives to build school buildings and buy school buses and give kids iPads, but we can't pass a local property tax to pay our teachers better or to reduce classroom size. Mm -hmm. If we do that, the state of Oklahoma will reduce their allocation to our schools by whatever we're putting into them. They'll punish us for trying to help. Is that why the governor wants to have the state education secretary under each governor's control as opposed to having that person elected? Oh, that I have no idea. I haven't talked with him about that proposal, but I do know that Governor Stitt is supportive of the idea of local control over education funding. He and I have talked about that a lot. Um, and I think, you know, every community is different. Um, Tulsa has different needs than uh, a city out in the panhandle, and yet we're the, we have the same per pupil funding formula applied as if there's no difference in the educational environment that our kids are growing up in. So uh, I'm a big believer that if Tulsans were given the chance, they would fund our schools the right way. Uh, we've done that on public improvements on our streets. We've done that to make us more competitive from a quality of life standpoint. When we didn't have enough cops, we got public approval to hire more police officers. So every time that the citizens of Tulsa identify a need, they're willing to step up and pay for it for the good of the community if given the chance, but they don't have any ability to do that mm -hmm. under the current structure in the state. By the way, all the surrounding states around us, they let their local communities do this. We're the pariah there. Mm -hmm. We're the only ones that can't do that. But I think, you know, I, I have a daughter in, in Tulsa Public Schools. She has 31 kids in her, in her fourth grade classroom. Uh, we love that school. It's a wonderful school, great teachers, great administrators, mm -hmm. but they are overloaded. They, their per pupil ratio is way off. Uh, with no signs of getting better. And their teachers at this point are largely there out of loyalty to the school in Tulsa and Oklahoma, not because they're being paid a competitive wage. Well, so George I would Kaiser, love for us to be able to do more. George Kaiser, the man who so graciously gave, has yes. given us so much, the yep. gathering place for one, came out with a list about a year and a half ago of what could be done by state lawmakers to improve the overall economy and mm -hmm. economic outlook for the state. I think you saw that. Sure. Uh, and yet it was kind of poo-pooed in mm. both the House and the Senate. Uh, that was before the last gubernatorial election. But he's right. Yes. He's absolutely right as a way to infuse money into the state of Oklahoma. And his point, their point being, well, if we implement this, they're not going to drill for oil in Oklahoma. And his point was well taken, or counterpoint, when he said, if there's oil, they'll come drill. <laughs> they'll right. be there. Yeah. Are we going to break this cycle of kotoing to special interests to help improve our lot in the state? Well, I, I hope that local communities are more empowered to do that. Uh, you know, they're, I, I found I a lot of frustration. Well, no, no. And, and I also think, you know, the, the phenomena that you point out, the notion of, you know, one of the most successful businessmen in the history of this state uh, who has built not one but two enormous companies, mm -hmm. two of the largest companies in our state, uh, one publicly traded, one privately held, 
and for people not to take his guidance <laughs> on what could improve our economy seriously uh, is pretty ridiculous. Uh, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met with. That's, I love meeting with him and getting his ideas because he's a genius and uh, more people ought to listen to him, I think. I totally agree with you. We've got about four minutes. Mm -hmm. I want to play with uh, something. Where I want to go where we haven't been yet. There's mm -hmm. going to come a time when you're going to wake up in the morning, you're going to sit on the side of the bed, and you're going to say, you know what? I want to, and then there's a blank, trout fish, <laughs> go to the moon, Yeah. run for a higher office. Uh -huh. What are we talking about? So uh, when I ran uh, in 2016, I told people that I didn't think anybody ought to be mayor longer than eight years. Uh, uh, my grandfather served for eight years. Uh, mayor Maxwell, Jim Maxwell, uh, who if you asked my grandfather, he'd probably say that was the best mayor we ever had. He served for eight years. Uh, at the end of that period of time, you should have had enough time to get done what you want to do if you're working hard enough and also be close to being burned out Does from the work. Does that mean you'll be stepping us out of politics? That's what I committed to when I ran, that I would only serve two terms. In uh, this office? Correct, correct. But are there other offices out there that you Well, I love in? public service, and, and I, oh, I'm... Oh, you're kidding. No, I, <laughs> I do. Uh, <laughs> and I'm confident that there'll be something else. I mean, my... To be completely honest, my nightmare is getting to a point where I feel like I'm not useful or helpful. Uh, that's a, one of my greatest fears. Last and, question. Yeah. So I, I would certainly want to look at stuff, but only after I've run through that finish line as mayor. Well, maybe you could play a rock band, you know, you could get into something. Yeah, I wouldn't the... hold my breath on that one. <laughs> <laughs> when it's all over and it's time to put your head on the pillow and listen for the wind to blow. Mm. What do you want your legacy to be? Uh, that Tulsa is a city with higher expectations than when I came in, uh, that has had a new generation of leaders introduced into the overall leadership structure of our community who can cause that change in positive motion to be sustained over decades uh, and that every kid in Tulsa has an equal shot at a great life. That would be the ideal. All right, that's assuming, big assumption, that you're only going to walk away after being mayor. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's assume at the end of your life, mm. at what and God knows what will come between now and then. Mm -hmm. Any idea what you want to accomplish between here and there? Um, the, the biggest thing, and I know this because I think a lot about my granddad, who you and I were talking earlier, he's mm -hmm. 93 now, he's been my hero my whole life. Uh, and he's the value, sharp as a tack, he by is, the way. he is. But the, I think about his life in the context of my own. For me, I will feel successful at the end of my life if my kids are proud of the job that I did. That's the ultimate test for me. That's a great answer. Hey, thank you, Mr. Hey, Mayor. thank you. Appreciate your Appreciate taking time. It. And I'm going to settle back and watch now. <laughs> and we're going to see. We have a lot going on. There's a lot to watch. Oh, man, I wouldn't be in your shoes. I wouldn't <laughs> give you, David Letterman used to say, I wouldn't give your job to a monkey on a rock. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again. We're all out of time with uh, his honor, and we thank you for joining us. And gosh, I hope we get a chance to do it again. I'd love it. Again someday. Yes, sir. And we thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.